Hi, welcome back to Existential Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. First things first, yes, I got a haircut, finally. You may wonder, where'd you get a haircut in the middle of the Corona apocalypse? Well, I got a haircut in the middle of the Corona apocalypse in my kitchen. So my wife gave me a haircut, many props to her, little light smattering of applause for getting the hair out of my face. So thank you, Nicole, for that. So uh, this video is going to be the very first video that is going to appear on test three. And we have a brand new thinker. Jean-Paul, how do you say this guy's last name? Well, actually, for English speakers, there are two basic ways of saying it. One of them is Sartre, like you just dropped the RE off the end of his name, and the other one is Sartre, where you retain the RE at the end of his name. Probably Sartre is a little bit more common, but I grew up saying Sartre, so I'm gonna stick with that. So Jean-Paul Sartre, there are his life dates, and you might infer from his life dates that he might be a contemporary of Albert Camus. And that's exactly right. They were contemporaries. They were living in Paris uh, for a number of years, quite a number of years at the same time. Uh, they did know each other. They did interact with each other. They had a famous friendship and then a famous falling out after that. But at any rate, Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, 1905 to 1980, and the first thing maybe uh, you should know is that we're going to be focusing on Sartre's relatively early works rather than his later communist Maoist period. So we're going to be definitely focusing on the more phenomenologically oriented Sartre. So the Sartre of Being and Nothingness, which was published in 1943. So um, uh, it's going to be a very technical phenomenological inquiry into the nature of existence. This is the first uh, thinker, I believe, yes, the first thinker this semester who's going to be doing a very technical kind of phenomenology. The other thinkers, you can, can, you can argue that they're doing a sort of de facto type of phenomenology, but Sartre definitely is working within the phenomenological tradition. So, Let's remember what phenomenology is about from your test one material. So phenomenology, to put it in very rough and approximate terms, has to do with reflecting upon our everyday subjective experience of life in order to come to some insight or some understanding of its underlying structure, meaning, or coherence. So that in rough terms is what phenomenology is about. So Sartre's way of glossing the project of phenomenology uh, is crystallized in that little epigram that's in, uh, at the, in your notes right there, right beside me. So existence precedes essence. So to get into Sartre's view of what phenomenology is and consequently the insights that derive from it, probably a good starting point would be to figure out what he means by existence precedes essence. Okay, so existence means that we're in the world first and only on that basis do we come to some idea of what it means. All right, so existence is our being in the world, our living our everyday regular lives comes before, that's what precedes means, and essence is however we understand the meaning of it. All right, so why would this be a, a convincing way to see things? Well, uh, partly you can sort of get a handle on this by looking at what happens to us when we're children when we're little kids. So basically what's going on is uh, we're thrown into this existence, we're born, uh, and little by little uh, we have experiences of it. And uh, as we're going along, we're trying to make sense of what, what that really means and how the game works, right? So when you're little, if you put it in Piagetian terms, okay, so the famous developmental psychologist Jean Piaget, when we're infants, we're trying to figure out things in a sensory motor type way. In other words, like how our senses work, how our, our motor activities follow from the way we can command our bodies and so on and so forth. A little bit later in the pre-operational stage it has to do with uh, imitation among other things and sort of figuring out how that works. But kind of the idea here is that while we're in the world first and only after we experience something do we then have a basis for saying something about the essence of it, like what it means. Uh, okay, so the other thing that you might uh, get a handle on early on is that when Sartre uses this word essence, it's very unlike 
essence the way some other philosophers use it. And in your notes, I compared it to uh, Platonic forms. So for Sartre, uh, essence, the way he's talking about it, would be in a way the exact opposite of a Platonic form. So a Platonic form, according to Plato, in other words, like the forms are the enduring truth behind all of the particulars of our lives. So in a sense, essence would precede the particulars of existence for Plato, but for Sartre it works the other way around. So for Sartre, existence, we're in the world first, and only then do we come to some understanding of what the essence, the to be of it, is all about. So uh, those are the two ideas, I guess, that would be good to start out with. Now, uh, because for Sartre, existence precedes essence, uh, he doesn't want to fall into the trap in doing his phenomenology. He doesn't want to fall into the trap of inadvertently deferring to some idea of essence that would come before our experience. All right, so if he, his, his desire is to be true to the animating spirit of phenomenology, to be simply reflect upon our experience and derive whatever truths come out of that, rather than positing some sort of truth that has to come before our experience, which would preordain the particulars of our experience. So what would such a version of truth be? Well, there are any number of them. I guess the Platonic forms might be one, but a much more common one would be thinking of our existence as a manifestation of God's will. Okay, so it's going to get a little bit theological here for a second in this video. So thinking about how God created man or humankind, you know, and consequently created a human nature for us would be a deviation from the phenomenological project as Sartre understands it, to simply reflect and then derive whatever conclusions come out of our reflection. In believing in God, in this case, as the creator of our human nature, would be a way of saying, well, there's something that comes before our experience in the world, so if you really want to understand human existence, you ought to read the Bible or some other uh, canonical religious text to understand how God works and God's desire works and so on and so forth. So uh, for Sartre, phenomenology has to be atheistic. Okay, so, and this may remind you a little bit of Camus, because when we were looking at Camus, his, his idea was that, well, uh, believing in God is a form of philosophical suicide. It's a way of deflecting our attention away from the unsettling uncertainty and absurdity of existence. Well, for Sartre, phenomenology likewise has to be an atheistic project. And the reason why is because if you're positing God as the creator of life, the universe, and everything, well, in a way you're preordaining the answer to what your experience would tell you. So he wants to be true to that Let's just look at it, what we're experiencing and derive whatever conclusions may come. By the way, it's not just religious and theism that falls into that trap. Like if you, if you uh, believe in the principles of scientific inquiry, you know, you can do the same sort of version of the same thing. Well, the principles of scientifically uh, demonstrable reality come first and then everything else is an expression of that. Well, that similarly would be a deviation from phenomenology the way Sartre wants to do it. So it's not just religion that falls into that. Now, in your notes, I gave you a little bit of working vocabulary uh, toward the end of the first page that is handy for describing that sort of thing. Some of it comes from Latin, so you'll be learning a little bit of Latin here. So uh, a typical distinction that often appears in other modes of, of philosophy, not just this Sartrean uh, phenomenology, is the distinction between the a priori and the a posteriori. Okay, so when we speak of the a priori, what that means in Latin is, uh, it's a little bit hard to translate, but it, I guess a literal translation would be something like, <laughs> away from the more first. <laughs> And okay, that sounds like probably awkward as hell. Uh, but the way we understand it in English is something is a priori when it comes before, okay? Like it's already there. So if you're a theist, God would be a kind of a priori, all right? So God comes first, human beings and human nature come second. So God would be the a priori. Now the other Latin phrase is a posteriori. Some, okay, literal translation in Latin would be 
Uh, this one's probably even worse, like away from the more behind. <laughs> Sometimes, uh, you know, in other languages, it's difficult to sort of come up with a very direct translation. So, uh, a posteriori in regular English means uh, something that comes afterwards. Okay, so a priori means something that comes before. Think of it this way, in this simple way. A posteriori means something that comes afterwards. All right, so another couple of terms uh, that I gave you, sort of the distinction between deduction and induction. Okay, so deduction is the kind of reasoning that starts with general principles and then reasons about particulars. Okay, so hopefully that's sounding a little bit like the Platonic forms to you. So you start out with some principle that describes a form and then on that basis you would be reasoning about the particulars as opposed to induction which works the other way around. You're looking at particulars and then trying to infer what the general principle is. Okay, so four vocabulary phrases, I guess, for you. So to use these vocabulary phrases in a way that is more or less consonant with Sartre's idea of phenomenology, uh, for him, inquiring into existence in the way we've described it would be a kind of phenomenological induction. Okay, so it's starting from the particulars of our experience, reflecting upon the particularity of our experience, and trying to get some kind of understanding of the more general structure of that. So it's not going to be an a priori type movement. It's not going to be a deductive type movement. It's going to be more of an a posteriori inductive type movement. So hopefully, that um, vocabulary might help you understand a little bit more about how Sartre is thinking about his project phenomenology in addition to, I don't know, improving your GRE score maybe somewhere down the line, something like that. Okay, so this project of phenomenology is going to be uh, inherently and irreducibly atheistic. So he claims, he's right up front about it. Uh, he, you encounter it very early on in your reading assignment, which by the way, here's your reading assignment, Essays in Existentialism, the whole part one. So that's going to have three parts to it. So the first part is an essay, very famous essay, called The Humanism of Existentialism. The other two sections are excerpts from being in nothingness. All right, so early on in The Humanism of Existentialism, you're going to encounter this talk about atheism, and now you know why he would deem that to be so important because for him if you start out with God you're not doing existentialism like notice the difference by the way between Sartre and Kierkegaard like a very theistic thinker like Kierkegaard for for Kierkegaard you can't do existentialism without God for Sartre it works the other way around you can't do existentialism with God Okay, so, and what you might infer from that is, wow, these existentialists have really, really different ideas, even at the sort of ground axiomatic layers of the project, and that would be true. That would be true. Okay, so uh, existence precedes essence. So that's sort of the first idea. Now, second idea, and this is going to take us a while, I'm not sure we're going to get through this one in this video, has to do with the fundamental nature of our freedom and responsibility. Most of the time for existentialists, freedom and responsibility come along together, okay? So, uh, in fact, so much so that you can even say that, well, they're just different aspects of the same thing. Like freedom is viewing our existence from a certain perspective to say, our, to say that we're free, and responsibility is a way of viewing our existence from a slightly different perspective, but really they're viewing the same thing, their views on the same thing. So uh, freedom and responsibility for Sartre are radical, okay? And here I want to use that word once again uh, with respect to its Latinate etymology. My goodness, you are learning so much Latin in this particular video. So we get the word radical in English from uh, the Latin word radix, radicus, third declension, if you study Latin. And that's the word that means root, like the root of a tree or a plant, the thing that is anchored in terra firma, that's the earth. Okay, so uh, it's radical in that sense, not necessarily in the Cal Californian 
sense of being like hell a bitchin' dude or something like that, okay? So it's radical. Freedom and responsibility are radical in the sense that they run to the very root of what we are as beings that exist, okay? So this is, in a sense, the second uh, phenomenological insight that Sartre gets. And actually, this is connected to the existence precedes essence thing. And the reason why is, I'm looking at my notes to see if I'm sort of getting ahead of myself. Well, I'll just give you the reason why since I gave you the setup. Okay, so if there's no a priori thing or God or set of principles or essence that somehow preordains our human nature, in other words, preordains what we are and what we experience in this life, well then, in a way, a logical consequence is that, well, we must be free. Well, why is that? Because if there's no master puppeteer, as it were, either in the form of God or in the form of scientific principles or anything else, well, then we must be without um, a kind of manipulative force, in a sense, like guiding our lives and our actions and our experience. Like we're not, life isn't just about sort of fitting into a particular mold or being like a puppet, sort of like dancing on the puppet strings of this, that, or the other thing, however you want to conceive of uh, what might be manipulating us, you know. So uh, for Sartre, there's no master of puppets a la Metallica. You getting it? There's no master of puppets. Um, <laughs> Oh my goodness, I think coronavirus uh, cabin fever might be getting to us. So we're quoting Metallica in order to exemplify Sartre. Hey, that might be an obvious test question, wouldn't it? So, uh, so there's no master of puppets, and the implication is that we're free, because there's ultimately no sorts of strings that are manipulating us, either from God having determined our nature ahead of time, or scientific principles operating in some complex way, having determined our nature ahead of time, or even here's another game you can play, like uh, the, the sort of characteristics that are... Um, operative within our being social beings and consequently we're just ultimately part of the social matrix and our sociality determines us through and through. Well, that doesn't work either. For Sartre, freedom is radical. It runs to the root, the rotix in Latin of who and what we are and so too does responsibility. Okay, so freedom and responsibility run to the root. Now here's the next idea you have to get. Sartre also incorporates an idea that he more or less takes from Martin Heidegger, who's the next thinker we're going to examine in this series of videos, and it's the idea of facticity. Okay, so I'm sure this is a vocabulary word for you at this point, so let's take a minute to describe what facticity is. Facticity has to do with all of the givens of life that you cannot change just as a function of your choice or you're wanting them to be different, all right? And there are any number of factors of our lives and our existence that are like that. For instance, you're inhabiting a certain body and not another one, and as hard as you might wish to inhabit another body that's maybe more attractive or more athletic or something like that, ain't gonna happen, at least as far as most of us know, you know? That you're born into a certain uh, historical period of certain parents. Uh, that's another element of your facticity, that you speak, uh, let's say, English as your first language. And yeah, you can learn other languages, and it's fun to learn other languages, by the way. But English, if you learn English as your first language, it'll always be your first language. If you learn a combination of English and Spanish, then that combination will always be your first ones. And yes, you can learn Russian, you can learn Serbo-Croatian, you could learn Urdu or any other language, but uh, whatever one you learn first will always be your first one. Okay, so all of these are different dimensions of facticity, all right? Now, here's, here's going to be the big trick, and this is, this is going to be a big deal. This is definitely going to appear on the test, okay? So, according to Sartre's analysis, freedom and facticity are always interwoven. Okay, they're always interwoven. So what that means, first implication, is it's not like your freedom is absolute, that you can wish for anything and wish real hard and have it be true. Sort of like um, in the old 60s TV show be Bewitched, right, with Elizabeth Montgomery. She could more or less wish for anything and it would automatically alter reality. That's not what our freedom is, okay? So uh, our freedom is always with respect to what we do not choose, 
Okay, so we ch our choices are always with respect to what we do not choose. Or another fancier way of saying that would be our freedom and our facticity are always interwoven. Another, I'm, I'm going to quote Sartre here, uh, your freedom is what you do with what's been done to you. Okay, so let's say that again. Your freedom, your choices, your decisions are what you do with what's been done to you. What's been done to you is on the order of your facticity. You getting it? So you may not have the freedom to decide you're instantaneously going to be in another body or you may uh, not have the freedom to decide, oh, I'd like to live in a, uh, another historical period like we've been watching that show Outlander, Nicole and I have recently, and a lot of that's set in the mid-18th century in Scotland and France and let's say Europe. Okay, so you may not have the freedom to just pass through the stones as it were and all of a sudden be alive in 18th century Scotland. Uh, but you do have a lot of choices about being in the body in which you find yourself and the historical period in which you find yourself and the fact that you have certain uh, talents, some of which are simply part of your genetic constitution, you know. Uh, you're, that doesn't negate your freedom. Facticity never re negates your freedom. This is a very important point because you're always having to choose how you're going to take up what you do not choose, what you're going to do with what's been done to you. You getting it? And the idea is that for any given facticity, there are actually an infinite number of possible choices you could make. Like with respect to being in your body, you could be happy about it. You could be sad about it. You could use it as an occasion to develop what talents you have. You could use it as an occasion to address what weaknesses you have. Um, let's say you're uh, in a body, you're not particularly happy with it because you're overweight. Like I'm a little overweight now. So part of what I've been doing during the coronavirus is using my factical freedom to go out and exercise. Okay, so the, the fact that I'm in an overweight body doesn't necessarily mean that, well, I have to be depressed because I'm in an overweight weight body and I feel so victimized by life and the universe is such a cruel and malevolent thing because I've got my belly is too big and all of that. So well, you know, the fact that you're in that body might be the occasion for you to be a little bit defiant of it, you know, and go out and actually uh, do some cardio, which my wife and, been, and I've been doing. We're both a little overweight actually, but that's all right. You can, you're still free. Just because you're in a particular body in a particular way in a particular historical period within a particular socio-cultural matrix with various power structures running through it does not negate your freedom. Because you always at least have the freedom to decide an attitude. If nothing else, you have the freedom to decide an attitude and what the meaning and significance of your facticity is going to be for you. You getting it? And the implication of that is that there's actually no such thing as a bare facticity in this world. In other words, a facticity that is somehow separable from your ongoing choice of meaning, attitude, uh, emotional response, uh, how you're going to think of it cognitively, and so on. Your mode of engagement, whether you run away from it, whether you face it, whether you do something else, and so on. There's no such thing as a facticity that simply rules you through and through and by rules you, what I mean is somehow negate your choice, at least with respect to attitude. If you're in prison, let's say, well, that would be a radical negation of freedom. Not actually, because when you're in prison, you retain the ability to decide how you're going to take it up. Once again, whether you feel mad or sad or whatever, you could use it as a, a uh, occasion for spiritual edification. Uh, in our Last one of our last videos, we talked a little bit about Timothy Leary's experience in prison and how, uh, in a way, you know, he took it up as an opportunity to work on his meditation practice and and sort of settle down from all of the unsettling dy dynamics of celebrity that he was immersed in and so on and so forth. Well, there's, in other words, there was nothing about the experience of prison for him that necessitated that he be miserable and so he decided he was going to be happy about it and he was going to use it to build himself up rather than you know just sort of grovel and be miserable and all of that kind of stuff so and if that's true of 
uh, things like prison, or if it's true of, I think another example, let's see, I gave you in your notes, is Viktor Frankl's experience. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit down further in your notes, but Viktor Frankl's experience in the uh, concentration camps during World War II. And he was in several of them. He was in Dachau, if memory serves, and Auschwitz, and uh, there might have been one more. Um, but at any rate, what he discovered is that the critical factor that most influenced whether prisoners in concentration camps were going to survive is the sense of meaning that they had as they went through the experience. And the thing about meaning of your experience is that you're always free to decide another one. In other words, what he discovered is in the case of the camps in World War II, it became even more obvious than normal that freedom and responsibility, here responsibility is how you respond to the world. Your ability to respond is what your responsibility is actually all about. Your freedom and your responsibility were actually, when it comes down to it, the main ingredient that determined whether people were either going to keep trying to survive or whether they would just give up. And in those concentration camps, if you gave up, you're probably not going to last the rest of the day. Okay? You just be blunt about it. So, uh, for him, once again, he discovered meaning, freedom, and responsibility in the place where you would think that all of those would be radically negated. Turns out not to be the case. Okay? So, in your own life. Uh, maybe it's not the case either. Now, Sartre, in uh, your first reading assignment, uh, says it <laughs> in a typically provocative Parisian way. The Parisians, man, they love to say things in the most provocative way possible. Uh, the French philosophers tend to do that in general. So he goes, even in war. Now, let's bear in mind that he was writing this stuff during the World War II period, okay? in France. All right, so France was, uh, you know, the Vichy regime. Let's remember a little bit of history. So the Vichy regime was sort of a puppet type regime set up by the Nazis who were really in control of things in France at the time. So he goes, even in war, there are no innocent victims. Wow, <laughs> even in war, and he's writing this in the most cataclysmic, devastating war of all time that humanity has known thus far, but we're endlessly creative, okay? To remain a passive victim, one must choose the attitude and posture of a passive victim. So if you're getting beaten up by life and uh, your response to that is to be a victim, part of the victim narrative that we typically have is that you have no other alternative because life is hard. Life is hard. All right. And so you have no alternative but to be beaten up by life in one way or another. Well, the, the thing is that that's, a, that's an illusion. That's a complete illusion because suppose you're being beaten up in life but you choose a different attitude. Like suppose you're let's say, defiant in the spirit of Albert Camus' analysis. You have a kind of existential defiance inside of you. So if, you're, if life, life is hurting you and beating you up, but you're defiant and you're raging against it, raging against the machine, perhaps, you know, um, all of a sudden, the whole role of victim isn't there anymore. The whole meaning of your experience as a victim has been undone because now, you're a defiant person who's getting hurt and beaten up for sure, but your defiance and your capacity to fight back makes you no longer a victim as such. You're something else. You might be a lion, you might be a, a, a warrior in some sense, and even if you're losing the war in being a warrior, that's different from being a victim. Okay, so even if if uh, the war kills you, and by the way, the war will kill all of us, all right? So if you think of life as sort of a war writ large, you know, <laughs> like a Heraclitus once said that war is the father of all things, or strife is another translation, is the father of all things, which means that if you're human, you're already a warrior. You're already sort of stuck in the battle. All right, so the question is how are you going to take it up? Okay, so once again, the, the camera has gone off, so uh, that's my reminder to try to put a cap on this, that the, the video is already getting long enough. So uh, let's, uh, let's wind up this, this point about 
facticity and freedom by looking at a famous example from Sartre. Okay, so one of Sartre's examples, I just noticed that there's a whole bunch of hair on my shirt. So if you were to see that in a Sartrean light, my goodness, it seems like a facticity. I have choice about it and my choice is to try to brush it off but still look like an idiot in front of you. Okay, so um, uh, let's look at Sartre's example. So you're walking along a path and a big boulder falls in front of you. Okay, so the facticity of the situation is that there's hu this huge physical object that let's say blocks your path as you're walking along a, let's say, a relatively narrow path through the woods or something. This huge boulder falls in front of you. So the question is, um, is there anything about that facticity that necessarily determines your response? And probably from the point of view of our uh, prevailing uh, sort of victimhood narrative that we like to indulge in, the answer would be, well, yeah, like, you can't go on. You got to turn back. You got to go back home because you're the victim. You're the victim of facticity. And it's like, um, actually, there are many other options. Sure, that could be one option you could pick, but here's some others. If you were a little bit more defiant, you could try to climb over the boulder or perhaps tunnel under it. That would probably be not a very efficient way. Perhaps try to sort of uh, maybe maybe you would uh, come back with a hammer and chisel and see if you could chisel your, chisel it down to, to uh, little manageable pieces or something like that. Or you could uh, decide that, well, this is an omen from the gods and it's time to sort of uh, pay obeisance to the gods and kneel in prayer or something like that. You, If you were of a more scientific inclination, you could maybe uh, see it from the point of view of being a interesting mineralogical specimen. You know, it's like a sedimentary, sedimentary rock. Like I think it's like red feldspar, something like that. You know, so you could look at it from that point of view. You know, you could, you could take it as an opportunity to, uh, to decide that, well, um, this is life's way of telling me I need to rest. So maybe you could just sort of uh, sit next to the boulder in the nice shade of it and cool yourself down. Because what's the point? The point is that even in something that just seems like a bare factical reality, there's an infinite number of choices in a way you're infinitely free with respect to any facticity, you know? So the boulder is a very simplified one, but um, you know, look, look at any other aspect of your life and ask yourself, is it really the case that you just have to react in way X? Is there any point in your life where the factical elements of what you're going through determine your reaction through and through so that really you're nothing but a puppet dancing on the strings of whatever boulder happens to fall in the figurative path of your life? Is that really true? Or when you think about it in a little bit uh, more deeply, is it more the case that with respect to any factical reality, there are an infinite number of choices and the fact that life is filled with all kinds of facticity doesn't negate our freedom, but quite the contrary, is the mere occasion for us learning to navigate in a wide undulating sea of infinite choices. Okay, uh, that's an introduction to Sartre. We'll get into more of this in the next video. Have a good day, if you choose to. All right, bye-bye.